Good evening. Hi. Welcome to the new school. Um, I'm Karen Cooney. I run the Vera List Center for Art and Politics here at the new school. And we've had the pleasure and honor of partnering with the Public Art Fund for many, many years in presenting these artists' lectures. For the next two years, the Vera List Center is embarking on an extended investigation of the subject of thingness or matter in an attempt to once and for all refute any lingering suggestions that we live only in disembodied existences and that our social lives only take place in cyberspace. So it's with a particular pleasure that we um, launched the fall season of the Public Art Fund lectures here at the New School tonight with um, a series of programs dedicated to the non-material aspects um, of uh, objects, or rather the vibrant uh, 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 essence of objects. Tonight's lecture is delivered by Michael Seilstorfer, whose fabulous tornado was inaugurated last night, and uh, different from the tornadoes we know, this one will last for weeks and weeks through um, early spring, I believe. Nicholas Baum, director and executive curator at Public Art Fund, will now introduce Michael, and we then uh, ask you to join the conversation with a Q&A at the end of the program. Thank you all very much for coming. Thanks so much, Karen. Uh, good evening and welcome to everyone. It's always a, a pleasure to be here at the New School and our thanks to Karen and Pam Tillis and uh, their team here at the New School for being such wonderful partners and collaborators on this august series. Uh, and although it's been running for a long time, it's always um, full of fresh ideas and people. And I think uh, Michael Salesdorfer is, is an example of that tonight. Um, I haven't had the chance to hear Michael uh, give a public talk. And I suspect probably most people here haven't either. So I, I think um, that will be exciting. I, of course, want to acknowledge the generosity of the individuals who help us to make this series possible. And I want to particularly acknowledge Jill and Peter Krauss, uh, who made Michael's uh, sculpture, which is now uh, at uh, Doris Friedman Plaza, which is the corner of Fifth Avenue and 60th Street. Uh, they uh, really helped us to make that work a reality. So um, very grateful for that. Um, this series uh, of three fall lectures is entitled The Limits of an Object. And uh, in this broader context of the programming that Karen talked about, examines the transformative potential of sculpture and its ability to reach beyond the material presence of an object's form. Michael will launch the series for us tonight and be followed next month by Paola Pivi, the remarkable Italian-born, Alaska-based artist who will speak here on October 5th. When I was in Berlin last year, I arranged to do a studio visit with Michael, who I hadn't met before, um, and I invited him to develop a proposal for New York. The spectacular new piece, Tornado, is the result of that. Michael was born in 1979 in Velden Wiels, Germany. Uh, he received an MFA from Goldsmiths in London and has also studied at residencies in Oslo and Los Angeles. His work has been exhibited extensively in Europe and, uh, of course, in Berlin, where he's represented by the gallery Johann Koenig. Please join me in welcoming Michael Selsdorfer. I'm showing a couple of pieces tonight I did over the last uh, nine to 10 years. Uh, that's the very first sculpture I made at art school. That's uh, from 2000. Uh, it's called Waldputz, means forest cleaning. And I thought it's best to start with uh, 
taking material away instead of adding new material. And actually, it's just a minimal sculpture by cleaning the uh, trees up to 2 meter 50 high, and the sculpture is 4 meter 80 by 4 meter 80. And it's made in the uh, Bavarian forest close to my father's farm. Uh, the piece was realized in 2000. This piece is from 2001. It's called Straße 119. It's a street uh, in the suburbs of Munich. And I was looking for a house which was going to be destroyed. Uh, I took the photo of the house um, just a day before the building was um, uh, took down. And uh, after the building was destroyed, I, I brought the uh, all the building rubble, the material to the studio, and built the sofa from from the material of the house. And um, so it's bricks, it's roof paper, and the idea is that the sofa is portrait of the house in design, and um, the photo of the house is hanging framed above the sofa. That's a piece from uh, 2002. It's called DIBRB, which is the number plate of an airplane. And it's a treehouse sculpture uh, made by an airplane, also installed in the Bavarian countryside. I did a lot of pieces, actually, in the countryside uh, when I started to do art, because uh, then I didn't have the possibility to show in galleries. And I just chose it's best to install them somewhere uh, outside. Probably that's, uh, that's the first public sculptures I did. That's a piece from 2003 when I was still at art school in Munich. Um, it's a drum kit made from a cut into pieces a Munich police van. So they are uh, green and white. Then I did a residency in Los Angeles a year later um, and prepared a show at Jack Henley Gallery in San Francisco. And I did another drum kit from an LAPD police car, which is now black and white. Now I'm showing the first video. That was also shot in the Bavarian countryside in 2002, which was my studio during that time. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, questions you have, uh, if something should be unclear in between. How long did it take to burn that house? 
Um, it took like almost two days to burn the complete material of the house. So we did cut the material with a chainsaw and fired the entire cabin in its own chimney, in its own stuff. And um, it was um, three cubic meters of wood. And that's also the title of the piece. S three cubic meters of wood with a good view. No, it was already there. So I was looking for a cabin. Um, I had the idea for the piece, was looking for, for a cabin. Then I found it, bought it from a farmer, and then we shot the video. That's a piece from 2003 called Shooting Star. Um, it's a sculpture, it was made for a group show organized by the Munich Art School and the Art School in Bologna in the city park of Rimini, Italy. And during that time we had no budget for shipments, so I decided to install it on the roof of my car and we drove it all the way to Italy and installed it there in the park. And um, before I shipped it, um, I did one test again at my father's farm, and I'm going to show the video of the first shooting star from the roof of my car. It works with bungee ropes and which are tightened by a cable winch. Uh, curators of this piece, the shooting star piece, and I was invited to a show in Hamburg at the Kunsthalle uh, to a show called Return to Space. And um, that was my piece for the show, which is a fiberglass sculpture five by five uh, meters, which is something like 15 to 15 feet, I think. And um, it's staged with uh, theater lights, and it's called Cast of the Surface of the Dark Side of the Moon. That's a piece from 2007. It's called No Light. It's casted uh, neon lights. Um, neon lights are casted in uh, ceramics. And it takes away the actual, func the actual function of the neon lights and they become a sculpture. That's a piece realized in 2005 which was also a public sculpture. It was in Italy, in Bolzano, at the Museum. Um, and it's two lampposts opposite, opposite each other. And uh, there are electric components. And when the currency is strong enough, the light starts to flicker. And a lightning jumps from one lamppost to the other, which is quite loud and irritating. And it's also close to a river where during the nights, night a lot of kids hang out and have drinks and um, it worked pretty well because they 
got scared all the time. Uh, that's a sculpture from 2005. It's called Official Visit, Hoher Besuch. And um, it's installed as a permanent sculpture um, in a small village called Hereford, uh, which is clo to, close to Hannover. And um, Jan Hood was the director of this new museum. It opened in 2005. The building is by Frank Gehry. And the whole mu museum is landed there, almost like an al alien. It's a small village, like 40,000 people. And most of the artists, curators, people viewing the shows, they, they, they travel there, they fly in. And I thought it's nice to, to take this up and do a piece with it. And um, so actually it's a helicopter parked outside in front of the parking of the museum. Lights are tur turned on and the helicopter plates are spinning like permanently. And the, um, the windows of the helicopter are mirrored so you don't actually see who is in the helicopter. So the helicopter is landed uh, like the museum is landed in the, in the village of Hereford. Uh, this piece is called Anna, which is actually a portrait of my sister. And it's a hair dryer which um, blows air into a microphone and which is amplified by an active speaker and it sounds like a, like a thunderstorm, like very loud. And actually that's, that is the beginning of a, of a series of sculptures. Um, where I was interested in the borders of sculpture and what sculpture actually can be and how sound can become part of the sculpture. So you have actually a sculpture that is small in physical size, but the sound fills up the whole exhibition space. So in an exhibition space of like 300 square meter, you enter the gallery and you immediately hear the piece and know that there is a piece of mine in one of the corners. This piece works um, pretty similar. That, that was the marquette of my degree show piece at the Munich Art School. The piece is called Reactor because it reacts to the um, visitors in the gallery. So it's a microphone embedded in a block of cement, of concrete. The microphone is connected to a speaker and um, through the setup, the vibrations of the floor are uh, amplified. So the more people are in the space, the louder the uh, pieces. And it's like almost, it's also increased by a feedback. So because the speaker is set close to the microphone, so it starts also its kind of own life. And when the gallery space is empty again, the piece is quiet. I have an example how, how this did sound. when the space is empty again. 
<coughs> and um, as I told, the small cube was a model, was a maquette for the actual piece. Um, that was my degree show piece at Munich Art School, which is a, a block of uh, cement, two by two by two meters, and it's um, 36 microphones embedded. Then it was in the staircase of the art school, so just when you entered the art school, and the more people walked through the staircase, the louder the piece got, and you could really hear it and feel it in your stomach in the last uh, room of, um, of the building. That's a view from the front. That's a view from the top, from the staircase. Uh, and that's some images, um, how we installed the piece, how it was built. Uh, there was a mold built in the, um, in the staircase. And I showed it because it was um, quite exciting, the install of the piece. Uh, first we built the mold, then we poured concrete into the mold. And the first time I installed it, the mold broke, and then the whole concrete was in the in the staircase of the art school, and we had to do it one more time. <laughs> yeah, uh, maybe you can use a microphone for the questions. Sorry, I didn't mean to break up the rhythm so much. I just had a question about logistics. And I, this is one of these questions, I don't know if it's like sensitive to talk about or if it's too awkward a question to answer, but the, I'm imagining that the budget for a lot of this work, or not a lot of it, but some of these works, it seems um, out of the reach for an average student. And I'm just wondering, is this getting fun? Like, I'm just curious how you dealt with logistics of actually getting these things realized. Is, is, I understand that in Europe there's a lot more funding for the arts than there tends to be in the US. So if that's too awkward a question to answer, we can skip it. But I'm just curious. No, it's, it's no problem at all. Um, I think for two pieces I showed right now, I got funding, like for the uh, for Dreistein mit Ausblick, which is a self-consuming house. We got like 4,000 euros by a bank in, um, from Munich, which, which was enough to produce a whole piece. And I think for the um, rocketry piece, we had 500 euros each student to realize a project. And, but um, the, and of course, the helicopter piece uh, was realized with a budget from the museum. But most of the early pieces are really built like um, with my own hands and looked for fabricators who helped me out. And so the early project, I really uh, I had no funding and just tried to get it working. Um, Uh, as I talked earlier, I was, um, I'm always interested in how um, sculpture can like expand into the space by sound, by smell, uh, by acoustics. And that was a setup um, in my studio. It was an experimental setup. And I wanted to make sound like visible. And that's actually a box with a speaker inside and I tried to break a window, um, glass, just with acoustics. Actually, it was a proposal for a Biennale in Norway, but it never happened because they were that much afraid. But uh, maybe I can realize it at another point, but I'm going to show like the video of the experiment in the studio.
That's a slide from my first show at Johann König Gallery in Berlin. It's again about how um, a sculpture can like expand, and it's a very strong light, like a search light. It's uh, an um, it's like a pedestal, referring to Konstantin Brancusi, and the piece is called Endless Column. And actually, in the gallery, you see a pedestal with a light column standing on it, which is uh, five kilometers high. And we open the ceiling, the roof of the gallery, to that the piece fits into the gallery space. Uh, that's a piece from 2005, which is called Time is Not a Motorway. Um, it's a tire of a car um, pressed against the gallery wall. It's rotated by an electric engine, and it wears out on the gallery wall. So during the exhibition, the gallery floor fills with rubber dust, and the gallery sp space smells like burnt rubber and it, the whole so the smell takes over the whole like gallery space and it's the uh, sculpture it's, is expanding into the space and usually I showed them as single pieces and I did a show at the SMAC at the museum in Ghent um, just now in uh, April in May and I showed one gallery space with five tires Um, that's a piece, um, it's called Pulheim Grabt. I was invited by a small city close to Cologne to realize um, a public sculpture on their, on their central plaza in the city. They had a, a certain budget and expected a sculpture to be erected. And um, three months uh, before the opening, I changed the... Um, budget into 28 pieces of gold, buried them on the, on the plaza without anybody knowing. And the opening of the piece was a press conference where, um, where it was announced that there is a gold treasure uh, hidden on this uh, plaza. <laughs> and that was like the, the opening was on Thursday and that was like on Friday. And so the gold pieces were on 28. They were not in one place. They, they were in uh, 28 different places. Like they were hidden in 28 holes. And um, the people who found something could take it home. And it was not um, registered. And people are still looking for gold there. I like that it's really an ongoing project. <laughs> that some guys that found something. That was after the first weekend, when it, <laughs> on a rainy day. And I really, uh, what was interesting for me about this piece is um, also what it created with the location itself, that the whole location became like a moon surface sculpture. And also like the press, there were like 500 press articles and it, uh, the piece really created its own energy. I think so, because they didn't, um, um, it's a very small town, and um, of course the curator wanted to have like a lot of attention to the city, and uh, I think he got what he wanted. Um, that's a piece referring to the very first piece, also to the cast of the surface of the dark side of the moon and also to the no light piece, like the neon tubes. And I think all of those pieces are referring to uh, Malevich, to the um, Schwarze Quadrat, to the black square. And that's like a three-dimensional black square, like a shadow hanging in the forest somewhere in Germany. And it's like a painted cube in the forest, just painted trees and ground with color. And that was for a museum show um, also in Cologne, in Düren, it's a museum there. And in the forest there was a camera installed, 
And in the gallery, there was just a monitor showing like a uh, one-to-one -one, uh, video screen from the forest into the gallery space. So during the night, you had no image, and during the day, you could see the piece. That was a piece for the Kestner Gesellschaft in Hannover, which is called Forst. That's six trees hanging upside down from the gallery ceiling, and they are spinning like very slow, cleaning their own leaves. So it's also referring to my very first piece called Waldputz. And during the exhibition, they are loose their leaves, and uh, the floor fills with the material. And in the back, as a reference, you can see the small photo of the Waldputz piece, which was like the sign in the, in the show. That's a piece called Loma. It's a 60 millimeter projection. And that was, um, the idea was to um, have architecture or a building like breeze, like almost like an organ. And um, I did shoot this piece close to Jena. And it's a like metal building, metal hunger. And I did explode it with dynamites and filmed it with a high speed camera in slow motion. And the material is um, like looped and like edited the way that you never see the explosion itself, but only like the expansion of material, like uh, parts of seconds before the explosion. And to have, to really see the uh, material, like the deformation and the breathing of the building. Um, that's a piece called T72, which was for a show called Neue Heimat uh, at the Berlinische Galerie uh, in Berlin. And it's a ready-made, it's a decoy, like a tank dummy, which is used by the army. I bought it in China after some research. And I changed it the way that it's... Um, so there are four blowers attached, and I changed it with other computer controller, so that it's like inflating and deflating permanently, so that it's, it also develops like its own life, almost like an animal, like a sleep or breathing. So and it takes about one minute to completely inflate and deflate. That's a piece called Rocket Tree. I did also shoot at my father's farm. It's from 2008.
Um, that's um, a pair of cloud sculptures which are made from inner truck tubes. Um, we, are, we now also used for the piece at uh, Doris Friedman Plaza for the Public Art Fund. I made them for the first time in my studio in 2008 and actually made them for a show in Brazil at Fortes Villacia Gallery. And uh, my show was in January. It was really cold in Berlin. And I thought, um, what can we import from Berlin to Sao Paulo, so I, uh, export? So I thought, OK, let's, let's export some heavy Berlin clouds. And then I looked for a way to do cloud sculptures. And I thought the best way is to use something with air. So I found the inner truck tubes. And that's how they looked like at Fortes Villacia, Villacia Gallery. That were um, 50 inner truck tube clouds installed in the gallery space. And that's a view of the show in total. You have um, the clouds, you have um, sculptures, like rope sculptures, that's um, casted ropes in aluminum, which are standing on pedestals. And you also have the loma, the breathing house, um, a 60 millimeter film, which worked very well with the uh, acoustics, with the uh, sound, which sounds almost like wind or storm. And it's like different knots, and uh, each knot on a rope is casted in solid aluminum. That's a view of the cloud sculpture in, at the K20, at the Museum of the 20th Century in Düsseldorf in Germany for the opening of the new gallery space. And that's the last um, slide, which is the piece we opened yesterday at Doris Friedman Plaza. And um, Like it's again, I, I thought it's good to use like those truck tubes because it's so much traffic around and probably a lot of tubes. So it's good to use the material that's there anyway. And also on this corner, you have Central Park. So, I, um, you know, that was the piece for the plaza. The base is uh, concrete. The in, the construction is uh, metal and the clouds are suspended from the metal construction. It's 33 feet tall. So that was the presentation. If there are questions, I'm happy to answer. Michael, uh, by the way, I'm hoping that this doesn't explode. I don't know if you have that in mind for later. But, um, can you tell us, um, I, I'm curious about your, um, the influence of your education on your work and the fact that you studied in sort of Europe and England. Um, could you talk a little bit about sort of the that intellectual background and training um, and how that influenced your work? I started to study Munich with uh, my professor Olaf Metzel. And it was, I started in 2000 and it was like, um, like the atmosphere of like, at, at, during this time in, in our course and with the professor, it was a lot about just doing things, like trying out different materials. And Olaf always said, just do it, and then we talk afterwards. And I think that was um, very important, like a certain drive and a certain energy. And at a certain point, I thought it's good to do, um, 
to see something else, and then I went to England and uh, studied at Goldsmiths. And I think both schools were very important, like the Munich School, which is a lot about doing and making and sculpture and workshops. And uh, Goldsmiths, it's, it's much more about uh, theoretical, theoretical backgrounds. And um, so I, I think um, those two schools were actually my education. I'm just curious to know, um, well, it seems like a lot of your work is about how the piece um, interacts with the environment. And I'm wondering how you envision this artwork to interact with the environment around it. Um, I think you're right. It's, it's always very important, um, um, like, where what piece for what surrounding and I think um, the first thing is always like to create like the biggest point possible contrast to, to what's happening around and I thought around this area it's everything is like quite quite clean and shiny and so um, I thought it's good to have like something like very aggressive and also something very raw like in the surrounding and on the other hand it's like very urban that's why I chose to use like rubber and concrete. And on the other hand, like you have the park and they also like this connection of like city and park. And that's how the tornado happened, I think, with this material. I have a question. Um, since this, your talk is part of a series of programs on the limits of the object, and you spoke so articulately about the, uh, what happens and what comes out of the object, such as the sound or the light. What goes into the object? Where does it begin? And to what degree is a narrative part of the object, such as the house that no longer exists and becomes now a domestic tool, mm. or such as the gold coin that refers to all kinds of fairy tales? Um, I think it's both sides. I think probably um, first thing is like the object itself with with the sound and it spreads out in this direction like through the smell and through the sound and in the gallery space but I think it can also spread out like through the narrative side like um, but as I'm, I'm, I think I'm always looking for something like beyond the the object or the thing itself. And yet some are some completely self-referential and you know, create and destroy themselves like finding this machine. Mm. And others go, seem to go on forever and not stop. I think there is um Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's right in any case, but um, I think it, um, For me, it sometimes feels the same, like the endlessness and and the like destruction itself. I think it's it it is like a similar thing to it. I think that's why I um, I use quite often like the um, repeating itself over and over and over again. And um, a lot of the videos are also played like in a loop. So also when it has a certain ending, it's like. Uh, doing the whole thing over and over again. Difficult question also. <laughs> uh, I hope this is an easy question. Did you uh, initially 
start working with these kinds of uh, pieces with uh, bicycle tubes? No, I started um, right away with the inner truck tubes. Like I wanted to be them like quite heavy and quite big and have a certain like volume. And I knew that when I first started to work with those tubes that I had to fill this gallery space in Sao Paulo. So I, I chose the biggest one right in the beginning. In that same vein, do you build models for your, for your sculptures or your installations before you build them? I think for, uh, like half, half, like some of the smaller pieces, like I just built in the studio, like, and for this big projects, I built a model also like to propose it. And I think it's uh, much more easy like to work with a model uh, compared to a drawing because you see pretty clear what's going on in the sculpture already when it's scaled down. Um, you mean like cruelty to the um, visitor in the gallery space or cruelty yeah. in common? So, yeah, on all levels, like the exposure to these painful apparatuses and these sounds, and uh, but also the cruelty, like the instant destruction of a tree or the self-consuming cannibalizing house, which uh, has, has a slightly shocking and at the same time gleeful moment in it because it's also, in case of the house, it's very neat, you know? It's just mm. like the way it disappears and eats itself up. But um, yeah, so that in relation to creation, that kind of cruelty. Yeah, I think with the house, it's really both on a way, but with other sculptures, I think it's also like a, a way to create attention when you have like a reactor piece or a a tire piece in the in the gallery space you can't just turn around because it's like present all the time and and that's what's important I think about some of the pieces and I think it's like a medium to create attention uh, maybe someone related to that I uh, just had two brief questions about um, what appear to be some uh, influences or reference points in your work, and I think related to this idea of cruelty would be, uh, I was just curious if you have an interest or uh, background in noise music or black metal music or power electronics or something like this, where it's, uh, yeah, sound as kind of an overwhelming presence in a sculpture. Um, and then another question was, uh, I was just curious if uh, you have an interest in the uh, film and video of uh, Roman Signer and his kind of destruction of objects as well for, for video pieces and ideas of duration, I guess. Um, yeah, I was always interested in, in music. I also played in a, in a punk rock band. And maybe that's, that's why I was also familiar with the equipment and started to use um, microphones and speakers but I think it's uh, the, the drive to do those pieces. Of, um, of course, you use material you're familiar with, and you you can use as tools this way. And but I think the try the, the drive was really to create like a piece that fills up the space and is like aggressive to to the viewer. And uh, Roman Sigma was of course always uh, important. Um, also, while I was studying, and uh, I was always like a big fan of his work. Um, yeah, the, the cement base is, um, in the very first maquette, it was just like a metal pipe. And I thought that, the, I, I thought for this sculpture, it's very important that it like connects to the, um, 
to the ground and really goes into the ground and it also add, adds like a lot of heaviness to the sculpture and makes it much more solid and um, that's how the cement base of this piece happened actually. Or the tubes, sorry, thank you. Um, so much of the other work, I thought, same thing with the, the kinetic wheels against the wall, of uh, the cube being, you know, or the light shooting through the ceiling of the gallery, the, the pieces being what they are. But then with these tubes, it seems like, for, for me at least, my mind goes to the body. They look, they, they suggest bodily organs and gestures of the body which is very different, I think, from a lot of what I've seen of your work tonight. And I was wondering if that's an intentional thing or if it's something that you're not really concerned with, it's just incidental, or I don't know, just curious to think, hear what you have to say about that. Um, I think in the end it's, it's just tubes, like, in, inflated. And, but, I, but what I always like about pieces is that it opens, like, um, different, like, doors and also... Um, like create like um, certain images by by its own, and I think of course it's what they're doing. They look like insects or bodies, and um, I think it's uh, really there in any case. And I'm also aware of it. Um, for me, I'm curious, kind of about the playfulness actually in your use of the physical object. Like, I like how you're negating what is predictable about a given object, time, space, or how you're treating, you know, light as a physical entity that deserves to be kind of considered in installation, um, the way that you open the ceiling of the gallery, et cetera. And I kind of am interested in you talking more about how you're playing with the audience and their expectation upon encountering something, um, wherever you can take that. Oh, what was the question exactly? I, I, I tend to not ask direct questions sometimes. It's kind of more like instigating just a response from you of like how you view like a playfulness and an irony with how you treat the physical object. Like, I mean, you're taking a tree in the middle of a field, blowing in the wind, and you're exploding it into the air. Like, there's a certain element of surprise and playfulness there, and I'm kind of curious about how you would articulate your intention with uh, kind of, uh, yeah, provoke, provocative acts like that. Um, I think, like, the playfulness is, like, um, like a very important uh, part of the work, truly, really, and I think that's how I most of the time uh, prove um, if I want to realize a, a piece, and I, sometimes I think, um, would I have it like, like as a five-year-old uh, boy? And I think that's, that's something um, which is always there, I think. just a, uh, a teaser uh, to the experience of the piece itself. Um, and I think it captures many of these, uh, I think, you know, actually very um, both viscerally arresting and layered and complex ideas that Michael's works uh, actually encompass. Um, giving the talk tonight was uh, probably not top of Michael's um, sort of agenda of things to do in New York. He's really focused on making his work, but I'm so pleased, Michael, that you agree uh, to do this. And I certainly learned more about your work through this process uh, and appreciate that you have given us this great work of art and the insight tonight. Uh, please
please join me. Thank you. Thanks a lot.